Nu ska vi prata om den här mannen som har kallats visselblåsarnas fader. I början på 70-talet släppte han 7000 hemliga dokument om USAs krig i Vietnam till en tidning trots att Daniel Ellsberg visste att han riskerade livstidsfängelse. Idag är han 87 år och i veckan fick han ta emot Olof Palmepriset och min kollega Anders Pilblad har träffat honom. I'm sitting here with a man that Henry Kissinger once described as the most dangerous man in America that has to be stopped. And now you are getting this award, this uh, Olof Palmer Prize. What does this uh, award mean to you? You know, I'll, I'll bet that Henry Kissinger thought in much the same terms of Olof Palmer. I've been reading a lot about him, and uh, certainly Americans thought of him as dangerous to their policy in the same way that I was, because he was telling the truth about it, just how unjustifiable we, what we were doing in Vietnam was. I, as an American, who by 1967 and 68, having been in Vietnam, uh, recognized just how criminal, really, our policy was, I was very impressed by his walking as a minister uh, in a march against the war. America was very unhappy with that. and. Um, Uh, so I think in, in that sense, uh, Kissinger would say, yes, Ellsberg was as bad as uh, Olaf Palme. You're sometimes described as the father of whistleblowers. Uh, in 1971, you were the whistleblower that released the Pentagon uh, documents about the Vietnam War to the press. At that time, what caused you to do that? Well, I had the example of young men who were going to prison rather than take part in this, what they saw as a wrongful war. And I had shared that same feeling. They revealed to me what it was worth doing uh, to withdraw one's own cooperation and consent to the war at personal risk. And so uh, they caused me, they put in my mind the question, what can I do to help stop this war now that I'm ready to go to prison, as they are? And the Pentagon Papers, uh, exposing them, 7,000 pages of top secret documents on the history of the war, uh, did expose me to an indictment of a possible 115 years in prison. So, uh, and really, I didn't experience that because of an almost miraculous uh, set of events which involved other people telling the truth about what Nixon had done against me, the crimes he'd committed. Wiretap me without a warrant, uh, which was then illegal, legal now after uh, the terrorist attacks here. In fact, all the actions he took against me, even including incapacitate me, are acts that are regarded as legal now in the new era in this century. But in those days, they confronted Nixon with impeachment or even conviction himself. They were then illegal, as they should be, and unconstitutional. And uh, he had to resign to avoid impeachment. That made it possible for the war to end. So by an almost miraculous set of events, uh, my trial was ended, and more importantly, the war was ended. You have met Edward Snowden. Can you tell me about that? Well, I, I admired Snowden because I'd waited, and Chelsea Manning, then Bradley Manning, because I'd really waited 30 years for someone to, uh, to do what I had done, which was to put out enough information that was being wrongfully withheld from the public to convince people that uh, something very bad was going on. Uh, what did you talk about, you and Snowden, when you met in Moscow? Uh, I asked what I often ask whistleblowers, why did you do this and your colleagues not? Uh, none of us can answer that, really. Uh, each whistleblower knows that he's, he or she is surrounded by people who also perceive that something wrong is going on. Now, why are they the ones who do that? It's very rare. I don't know. Uh, I think none of us uh, do know. Why do we need whistleblowers? Well, because governments, all governments, as an American journalist, uh, I.F. Stone said famously, all government officials lie. All and governments. All, government, all governments, and that nothing they say is to be believed. And that doesn't mean that everything they say is a lie. It does mean that anything they say may be a lie or is misleading the public as to what the motives are, what the expectations are, um, uh, what, what the considerations are that, that lead to these actions. Almost, almost every government official is, to some degree, misleading to that extent. And if it's to be changed, someone has to tell the truth. 
That means they have to break a promise that they've made not to tell what their bosses don't want known. And yet, and, and people are trained from the earliest days, don't break promises, you know, uh, uh, get, to get along, uh, go along, and that's what people do. So <clears throat> they have to come to realize that they have higher loyalties or other loyalties than to a particular boss, and that when other people's lives depend on certain truths being known, they should be ready to pay a personal price to, to save those other lives. Being an activist, how many times have you been arrested? Oh, something over 85 times, 86, 87. I saw some picture of you when the police arrested you and you were wearing a suit and a tie. I always uh, wear a tie when I'm getting arrested, uh, <laughs> even though I live in California where I don't wear a tie most of the time. What, why? Uh, on the, uh, some, to make people, if there is a picture or anything, aware that having a suit and a tie, possessing one, does not exempt you from the responsibilities of citizenship. And those include protesting and even facing, facing arrest in civil disobedience, like Martin Luther King. So the tie is, an, is a statement? It's a, it's a statement that it's not all, only uh, hippies or young people with long hair uh, who uh, uh, can afford to be arrested or who see the truth about how unacceptable conditions are. That even people uh, who observe uh, the conservative traditions uh, can and should act in a way that says, what is happening is wrong and you will have to do it over my body. You will have to arrest me to carry on this practice. And uh, so I do always, uh, I have a tie in the closet for that purpose. Uh, you are 87. Uh, what will you do when you grow up? <laughs> That's funny, you know. Uh, there, Mort Saul, a comedian in America, used to say about uh, uh, Jack Kennedy, who was our then youngest president, that his father had asked him, Jack, what do you want to be when you grow up? And Jack said, well, I think I'd like to be president. He said, no when you grow up, and uh, which, unfortunately, he, he was not allowed to do, uh, actually, like Martin Luther King and, uh, and Olof Palme, in fact. Um, I'll be doing this for the rest of my life. Uh, I don't think these problems will go away quickly. And so, as long as I live, uh, I will be trying to say, we can and must change the foolish and reckless and criminal policies that are now going on. That's possible. Mr. Ellsberg, thank you and congratulations on the prize. <laughs> thank you. Ja, tack Anders och tack Daniel Ellsberg för kloka ord och viktiga insatser.